Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Transfigured. This is going to be a monologue episode, and I'm going to be addressing the topic of Jesus and the divine name. I don't know, there's just been a lot of chatter out there on the internet about this recently, and this is also a perennial question. It's related to the James White and Dale Tuggy debate that I was at, as well as just other things that are going on. So I, I sort of felt like I was wanting to talk about this subject before and just didn't feel prodded. And now I feel prodded to um, give sort of my take on what is the relationship between Jesus and God's name, the divine name, the Tetragrammaton. I'll probably say it a couple times tonight, but I do have some Jewish friends that have sort of pricked my conscience to be, you know, at least a little sensitive about how often you say it and saying it in a respectful way. So for the most part, I'll probably say the Tetragrammaton, although I'll probably have to pronounce it at least once or twice to um, make any sort of sense. So um, before, I guess before I get into this slideshow, I thought I'd begin with a parable. So imagine that there is a father, and this is a really successful father, and he has a big business and many employees work for him, but he's getting older on in age. Some of the employees are getting a little bit maybe selfish and ambitious, thinking about what sort of power that they can have in this company. But the CEO has a son, and this son has been sort of off, you know, going to business school, doing the Peace Corps, doing all these sorts of things, but not really working for the company. And all of a sudden, the father, the founder of the company, says that he is going to be making his son the CEO. The father will retain the title chairman of the board, but the son will now become the CEO. And in addition to being the CEO, he's also going to be the president of marketing, the president of data analytics, the president of operations, all of these different titles that the father used to have, he's going to be giving these titles to the son. And some of the employees are disgruntled about this because they had been hoping to get some of these titles and powers for themselves, and they might not feel that the son's really proved himself worthy enough to be ready for this job yet. And so the son, on his first day in the office, he goes into the CEO's office. He sits in the desk to prove that he is, in fact, the CEO. He sends emails to the marketing department with uh, a signature in his email signature that says president of marketing. He sends an email to the operations department and in his email signature is president of operations. And he is using all of these titles and it seems like his father is giving him this blessing. The only title that the father still has is chairman of the board. But this has been the father's plan all along is to pass this company on to his son. And he knew that he couldn't handle it forever. So I think you might be able to tell where I'm going with that sort of parable. But I think that that is a similar analogy, obviously a human analogy. Don't take it too far for how I understand the relationship between um, Jesus and God the Father and the divine name. So now I'm going to sort of back up that parable with scripture. So the divine name, like, where does it come from? So the most famous uh, use and revelation of the divine name is obviously at the burning bush. God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So this, I am who I am, so the divine name being Yahweh, again, like I said, I'll have to say it at least once, but I'll try not to be too um, flippant with it the way that I think some people might be, is it means basically, I mean, if you were to super literally translate it into English, it would be something like am will or something like that, or it's sometimes it's translated, I am who I will be, or I am what I am will be, or something, you know, it's something sort of kind of strange like that. And I assume it even sounds sort of strange in Hebrew. In Greek, this was translated in the Septuagint, ego ami ho'on, which is basically like saying, I am the being, um, is sort of how it was literally translated into Greek. And then there's this second I am in the passage where it says, I am has sent you. 
And in Greek, that's just the ho'on part, like the being part um, in Greek. And so this is where the divine name gets revealed to Moses. And that sort of marks Moses as this recipient of this special revelation of knowing something about God. And I would also say that a name like I am who I will be, there's this whole theology of naming in the Old Testament. I can really only barely touch on this, but one aspect of it is that a superior names an inferior, and that the power to name something is a very powerful power. And this is a responsibility, like you can see God give it to Adam, and so Adam names the animals, and parents name their children, and those sorts of things. And so what sort of name could the person at the top of the pyramid have? If everyone gets their name from a superior, who does the person at the top of the pyramid get their name from? And what sort of name could they even have? And that's why I think it's fitting that God's name means something like, I am who I will be, because it's sort of like the person who doesn't have a name or who, or who can't be given a name, what sort of name would it be? It would be this sort of like self-referential, self-sourced um from himself, of himself sort of name. And I think that that's something that, uh, you know, obviously there's more to the divine name than just that. But I think that that's an interesting and important aspect. And so there's this book by Carmen Joy Imes, who I think, you know, I think I should interview her sometime. She seems like um, she has an interesting book and an interesting thesis and interesting things to say on this subject. But she talks about um, the commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. And oftentimes this commandment is sort of interpreted as, you know, you should be respectful of the divine name. I think that that's part of it, but well, I'll let her speak for herself. Let me make sure that the sound is good. This is an interview that she did on Remnant Radio about her book um, a couple of years ago. Oh, come on. So my doctoral study was on the command not to take the Lord's name in vain, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. And I had always imagined that that was telling us that we shouldn't swear or use God's name as a swear word, or maybe that we shouldn't um, take an oath in God's name and then break our promise. And I, when I was coming to Wheaton to, to do my PhD, I was in conversations with Dan Block about what I might write about. And he's, I asked him for suggestions and he said, you know, we have this command wrong. It really should be translated, you shall not bear the name of Yahweh your God in vain. And it has nothing to do with speech or we shouldn't limit it to speech. This is actually about how we live far more broadly than that. And I was fascinated. And so I began to investigate and I decided he's right. This command is not just about the way we speak, but it's about how we live. So the idea is that at Sinai, Yahweh is claiming the Israelites as his own people, as his treasured possession, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And to do that, he's putting his name on them, like stamping them with his name. And therefore, they need to live in such a way that his name is honored among the nations. So that would be uh, that would be bearing his name well. The command is the reverse. Don't bear my name in vain. So that would be saying I belong to Yahweh, but living as, you know, no differently than any of the neighboring nations. So I think that that is an interesting take. And you get this sense that being a bearer of God's name is an important responsibility. It has privileges, but also has responsibilities. With great power comes great responsibility. And that this people, this called out people group, gets stamped with God's name and then is tasked with the responsibility of living up to the high calling of doing that. And this idea of people or even angels bearing God's name, you can see it in other places. This is Exodus 23, 20 through 21. Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Be attentive to him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious towards him, for he will not pardon your rebellion, since my name is in him. 
So God is putting his name in this special angel. The special angel is leading the people through the exodus. And part of the reason why the people need to um, be extra cautious to listen to this angel is because God's name is in this angel. This angel is stamped with God's name and has this special responsibility of being God's agent and representative. So I want to talk a little bit about the Jewish concept of agency, um, and it's in Hebrew. I'll probably not pronounce this fully well, but you know, forgive me, shalia, which the main point of the Jewish law of agency is expressed in the dictum, a person's agent is regarded as the person himself. Therefore, any act committed by a duly appointed agent is regarded as having been committed by the principal, who therefore bears full responsibility for it with consequent complete absence of liability on the part of the agent. So if you've seen that movie 300, where um, King Xerxes of Persia sends a ambassador to Sparta to negotiate with um, the king, and this agent of King Xerxes is offering terms and um, rewards if Sparta will bow down and submit to Persia. And uh, King Leonides, I hope I'm getting that right, kicks this ambassador into a pit and kills him. And I think we all sort of understand, like, it's not just this weird ancient Jewish concept. I think the concept of agency is very intuitively understandable for people of virtually all cultures, that if you're disrespecting the person who was sent, then you're disrespecting the person who sent them. And if you're respecting the person who was sent, you're respecting the person who sent them. And these ambassadors or these agents might bear like a ring or a letter or some proof of authenticity and authority that's been invested in them. And that's sort of similar to this idea of the people of God or that angel in that instance bearing God's name as a way of being authorized representatives of him. And in order to be a agent that's operating in good faith, you can't bear the name of God in vain. You have to bear the name of God in good faith. And you can also see, I don't know, a similar but related idea in um, theophoric names. A lot of the names of characters in the Old Testament have the name of God in them. It could be either the name of God, like referencing Yahweh, or it could be El, which is referencing the word for God, Elohim, which is like God in a slightly more generic sense. It's kind of more similar to how our English word God works. Like Daniel, Daniel, like El at the end is El is an Elohim, and it means God is my judge. Or Elijah means my God is Yah, which is an abbreviation of the divine name. Um, Samuel, my own name, God has heard or God has listened, uh, because remember, Hannah asks for a son, and she is given Samuel um, in sort of reward for her faithfulness. So God has heard my prayer. That's what Samuel means. Isaiah, salvation is from Yah. Yael, right? Again, Yah can be at the end, but it can also be at the beginning, like Yahel, like Joel is Yah is God, and Yeshua means um, God saves, or Yahweh saves. And Yeshua, it should also be mentioned, is Jesus's name. Like, Jesus is just a different way of pronouncing Joshua. And so, this idea that, is Jesus the Tetragrammaton? I mean, part of it, you can tell, Jesus has a name that has part of the Tetragrammaton in it, but it isn't the Tetragrammaton. Jesus has his own name that in some sense, bears the Tetragrammaton. And so he's a bearer of the Tetragrammaton in his own name. But that's still a received sense of um, bearing the divine name. And you can also see Emmanuel, God is with us, right? There, some people will be like, oh, you can tell Jesus is God. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. Well, it's like God is with us is kind of probably the better translation. Like, you know, God is helping us, or we can tell by this person's presence that God is, uh, you know, listening to us and helping us is something a little bit more like the general idea. So transitioning from the Old Testament to the New Testament, I think that this parable is 
extremely insightful for a lot of reasons, but also having to do with the divine name, divine authority, and Jesus's relationship to the divine name. So I'll read this. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to the tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent to them another servant and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. So I think like you can tell that that parable that I made up at the beginning of this video is pretty similar to this parable. That there is this vineyard which sort of represents, I don't know, you could say um, the authority that the people of God were supposed to be taking care of in the Old Testament as bearers of God's name. And God is sending ambassadors, ambassadors messengers, prophets to them to send messages, and they are ignoring or um, shamefully treating them. And again, like I said, if you treat the agent badly, then that is a disrespect of the person who sent the agent. And then finally, the owner of the vineyard says, well, I'll send they, my son. They won't dare disrespect my son. They know if they mistreat my son. It's one thing to mistreat my slave. It's another thing to mistreat my son. But instead of respecting the authority of the son, they say, hey, this is an opportunity to steal the inheritance and make the vineyard ours, sort of like the wicked employees that I was mentioning in my own uh, parable. And I mean, there is a lot of symbolism in this parable. I think it says a lot about the um, relationship between Israel, the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant, and the Gentiles, and sort of how Christianity is sort of almost a transfer of God's blessing from the Jews to the Gentiles, uh, and that sort of thing. And there's a lot going on. Um, but uh, for now, just this idea that there's this beloved son who is the heir of the vineyard, who is supposed to be the special representative, even more special and unique than the one sent before, whom is supposed to command an extra level of respect and even fear, you might say, from the people whom they, he is being sent to, but that is not what happens. All right, moving on from that, I want to kind of highlight a couple passages that talk about Jesus as someone specifically coming in God's name just as the angel was sent in God's name to lead the people through the Exodus, or as the people of Israel supposed to be, were supposed to be bearers of God's name to the nation, so is Jesus a special and unique bearer of God's name. And uh, speaking of Palm Sunday, I'm recording this kind of before Palm Sunday. Um, this might come out after Palm Sunday, but these, that makes these passages especially relevant. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That's Matthew 21, 9. So again, this son of David, which is a messianic title, he's coming in the name of the Lord. And then Jesus says later, a couple chapters later in Matthew, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So again, Jesus is reiterating this idea that there have been prophets sent to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem has mistreated these prophets. And so here he is, Jesus coming in the name of the Lord. And Jerusalem is still not cooperating, is still not listening. 
All right, so I want to read this statement about G where Jesus is sort of giving a lecture about his status as an agent of God. This is in John chapter 5. And again, there's this idea out there, this came up in my dialogue with Trent Horn, that John has like this sort of uniquely high Christology. Like, sure, the synoptics certainly seem like they might have a low Christology, but you get this really high Christology in John. But I don't think that that's really true. I think that John, in many ways, emphasizes some of the aspects of what you could call low Christology, even though I don't think that's really quite the right way to put it. But again, a human Christology of Jesus, I think that you can see many of those themes, if not even more clearly in the Gospel of John compared to the, to the synoptics. So this is John 5, 30 through 43. Jesus says, I can do nothing of my own. Oh, that's a weird thing for God himself to say. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth, not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved." He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have not never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people. But I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. So you can imagine... A tricky thing about ambassadors is how do you know that they were really sent by someone? If they're coming from a far off kingdom or coming from a, tent, uh, a person who owns your vineyard, but you haven't seen in a while or from some far away place, or even if they're speaking on behalf of God in heaven, how do you know that they're a true witness? How do you know that they're a true messenger? And so surely the higher the message, the more evidence is required to believe that they are in fact a messenger of that a messenger of that height. And so Jesus calls in John the Baptist as a person who has witnessed to him. You'll remember earlier in the Gospel of John, the um, Pharisees send someone to John to ask him if he is the Christ. And John says, no, it's someone else. And John then baptizes Jesus and says that this is the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. And so John is one of the witnesses. And then another witness is the works that Jesus is doing. They bear witness that God the Father is working in him. And again, Jesus is acting just the way a faithful and obedient and humble messenger is supposed to act. He's saying, the words that I'm speaking are not my own words. They're the person who sent me words. These words are have a higher source than just me, myself. I'm not seeking my own glory. That would be unbefitting of a humble messenger. I am seeking the glory of the one who sent me. These works that I'm doing, they aren't for my own good. They aren't even of myself. They're the works of him who sent me. These are all the things that a humble, obedient agent and messenger is supposed to say. And this is how Jesus is giving testimony that he has, in fact, been sent by God. And again, that sentence right there at the end, I have come in my father's name. And again, that really connects to that parable of the tenants. Jesus is the son who's been sent by the father to bear a messenger to the tenants of the vineyard. All right, some more stuff from uh, the Gospel of John. This is from John chapter 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. 
I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Now you, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So again, you can see multiple things here. Jesus is someone who is speaking the words that God gave him. He is seeking God's glory. The authority that he has over all flesh is something that God has given him. And again, you see this relationship between master and emissary. God the Father is the master. He is the only true God. And Jesus Christ is the emissary sent on behalf of God. Now, regarding the glory that I had with the in your presence before the world existed, I suggest you go watch my interview with Trent Horn if you want me to answer more about why I don't think that that meant Jesus was up in heaven. Um, I, I'll just say briefly that Jesus gets glorified at the crucifixion, and this is sort of like a foreordained or a predestined glory, and Jesus is asking for this glory to now come true and be revealed in his own uh, crucifixion. This is the prayer that Jesus is praying shortly before he gets arrested in the Gospel of John. All right, continuing on. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. And again, Jesus, he's bearing God's name. He's bearing the divine name. He's manifesting it to the people. But it isn't his own name. It is his father's name. That's the crucial point. Like I could summarize this whole video. Jesus doesn't have the divine. Jesus isn't the one who is the divine name. He bears and manifests the divine name. That's the whole punchline, honestly. But I'll keep going to make that point in case you don't believe me yet. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that the, the they is the disciples. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in the truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and all yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name which you have given to me, that they may be one even as we are one. So again, Jesus is saying, look, God, you gave me a job to do. Father, you've given me a job to do. I have done it. I am trying to glorify you. You gave me some people. I did a, a diligent job. You gave me words to teach them. I taught them the words. They have received the words. These words are now in them. And I pray that they can be one with each other and with God and with Jesus, just as far as Jesus and God are one, right? This oneness is connected to this idea of being in God's name. Bearing God's name means that you are part of God's body, in a sense, manifested in the world, and that you are within sort of the identity of God, you know, loosely defined. Don't take that too literally. And that, so Jesus is like in this God identity thing because he's bearing the divine name and he is giving the divine name to be born by his disciples and then they will teach it and spread this name and it will continue to spread in a daisy chain style of ambassadors sent out to spread the word and that that makes them one together with God and the Father. All right, continuing on. Uh, come on, next slide. All right, so... This passage, I think, is also very interesting and relevant. It's from Galatians 3.25 uh, to chapter 4, verse 7. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. For there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoptions as sons. 
And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So I think the general idea here is pretty clear that a son of the house, even if he's going to inherit everything, goes through the sort of tutelage phase where he's underneath guardians and teachers and managers. And then he sort of graduates to become the son who then inherits everything. And in this way that we are brought into Jesus's inheritance, Jesus is the firstborn son in the house of God. And we are fellow heirs with Jesus because when we get baptized into Jesus, we put on Jesus and we put on our new selves and we become a member of God's family in this spiritual inheritance, which we are going to share through Jesus. And Jesus had to go through this phase where he was sort of a son underneath the guardian of the law, and he had to fulfill and complete the law before he sort of graduates into the son who is ready for his own inheritance. And in the same way, we also go through a similar phase. All right, so I'm going to read a long section that is about something very similar. This is John 8, 30 through 59, although I left a couple of verses out to try and make this shorter. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offering offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Again, Jesus is an obedient agent of his father. He's speaking the words that he saw with his father, and these people are not uh, listening to him. And if you're uh, committing sin, then you are slaves of sin. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we are not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Again, so Jesus doesn't come of his own accord. He is sent as a dutiful agent. And again, I don't think you need to hear this sending language as like Jesus was up in heaven and they get disembarked from heaven to be here on earth. In John chapter 1, it also says that John the Baptist was a man sent by God. So again, like sent by God means someone who's given a specific mission and calling by God. And you could ask, well, Sam, when was Jesus hearing these things with God? And I think that, well, I'll just say that I think that Jesus had some sort of spiritual experience where he was with God in some sense. Maybe you could say it was at the Jordan River. Maybe it was at some other time where he ascended to heaven and heard things from God and then was sent and disembarked in that sort of sense. Um, there's that verse, John 3, 23, where Jesus says, no one has ascended into heaven except he who also descended, the Son of Man. So the sense that the Son of Man has both ascended into heaven and descended again is there in the Gospel of John. So I think that that might have something to do with it. I'll admit I'm speculating a little bit on that one, but uh, if I had to answer that question, that's how I would answer it. All right, and you get this. So what's this tension? So the, these Jewish opponents of Jesus are saying, we're children of God, we're children of God through Abraham. And Jesus is sort of redefining sonship. He's saying, no, your actions reveal that you're actually a son of Satan because you are doing the works of Satan. It's as if the actions and activity that you do reveal who your true father is more than any sort of biological inheritance. So Jesus is redefining sonship based as like sort of obedience to a spirit of something, not just biological inheritance. Then the Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? And who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. Again, Jesus there identifies his father as the God of Abraham. Jesus isn't the God of Abraham who spoke out of that burning bush back to Moses. 
the person who spoke in the burning bush to Moses, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that is his father. He explicitly identifies that connection there. That So Jesus isn't the Tetragrammaton. It's right there in John chapter 8. But Jesus is this new person who's sent, who does have greater authority than Abraham, right? You can imagine Abraham and Moses and these other messengers. Those are the slaves in the house that get sent ahead of the son of the house. So the son of the house has greater authority than the slaves who were sent before as messengers. And this is this tension, right? You can imagine in Israel at the time, in Jerusalem at the time, to claim to be greater than Abraham was an extraordinarily weird and um, borderline blasphemous thing to do. But that's exactly what Jesus is about to do by saying, I'm not doing that to glorify myself. I'm doing that because this is the Father who glorifies me. It's not me claiming this authority on my own. God has given me this authority. Your Father, so let's hear, where, where did I go? Of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So in what sense did Abraham see Jesus's day? And I think that the only way to make sense of that is that Abraham saw prophetically into the future. You could say when God promised him, your, um, through your offspring, all the nations will be blessed or something along those lines, that Abraham was given some sort of prophetic promise of the Messiah. And so he looked forward to seeing the Messiah's day and prophetically he saw it and was glad. So the Jew said to him, you're not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? And this is this theme of misunderstanding. If you've listened to any of my videos, you've probably heard me talk about the theme of misunderstanding. But just to briefly repeat it, in the Gospel of John especially, there are many, many scenes where Jesus says something confusing. The audience misunderstands him, often by taking him literally, and then gets angry at him. And then Jesus tries to clarify, and then they get further confused, and then often get angry or violent. And oftentimes, in these themes of misunderstanding, Jesus is taking a symbol from the Old Testament, like Jesus could say, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. And Jesus is using the symbol of the temple to talk about his body. That's exactly what it says. It says he was speaking of the temple of his body. Or Jesus will say, I am the bread come down from heaven. He's using the manna in the Old Testament to talk about communion. He's using the temple to talk about the spiritual community of the body of Christ. And here he's talking about how there is this family of Abraham that was an Old Testament foretype of the family of God that is now available through the Son, and the Son is the source of the real, true, spiritual family of God. And that's exactly this point that Jesus is making. You Jews think that you're real children of God because of your biological descent through Abraham. That was simply a foretype of the real sonship, and those who are real sons of God listen to him whom God sent and hear his word and follow him, of the wrongs, the false sons are the sons who are actually sons of Satan who do the will of Satan. That's the real tr true test of sonship. Do you listen to God and do you do what the one whom God sent says, or do you do the works of Satan? That's the real test, not whether or not you're a biological descendant of Abraham. That was just a foreshadow of this true form of sonship. That's what Jesus is trying to say. The Jews, like they typically do in the Gospel of John, misunderstand him. They say, Truly, or they say, you're not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? You'll notice Jesus didn't say that. He didn't say that Jesus didn't say that Jesus saw Abraham. He said that Abraham saw Jesus. So that's a different thing. So they misunderstand him. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And they picked up stones to throw at him. You have to remember, the Jews almost always misunderstand Jesus in the Gospel of John. So when they pick up stones, it's not because they're like, oh, they knew what he was saying. They knew he was invoking the Tetragrammaton. They knew that he was invoking the I Am from back in Exodus, and that's blasphemy. And so they're just being good, dutiful, first century law followers and trying to execute a blasphemer because they perfectly understood what was happening. No, they misunderstand what is happening. And they are accusing him falsely of blasphemy. 
But okay, Sam, what does Jesus mean when he says, before Abraham was, I am? So I would actually say, again, I should make a full video on this. I, this is this treatment that I'm about to do will not do it full justice, but I'll still try and give an answer. I think that the proper translation would be, before Abraham comes to be, or before Abraham becomes, which is actually a better translation of the Greek tense of that verb there. I won't go into it now. You'll just have to take my word for it. I'll promise to do a fuller video on this sometime. Before Abraham comes to be, I am he. Jesus is claiming to be the one that Abraham looked forward to seeing. In other words, he's claiming to be the Messiah. Many times in the Gospel of John and in the other Gospels as well, Jesus will say, I am he, as a way to identify himself as the Messiah. Like back in John chapter 4, when the woman at the well says, well, we know that the Messiah is coming and that he will lead us into all truth. Jesus says to her, I, the one who's speaking to you, I am he. Again, he's not saying, he's not invoking the divine name. He's saying, I'm the Messiah. And there are many other places in the Gospel of John where I am he means I am the Messiah. And not just the Gospel of John, other Gospels as well. So he's claiming to be the Messiah. And before Abraham comes to be, so just as in an earthly sense, Jesus is after Abraham because Jesus is a descendant of Abraham. But in a spiritual new creation sense, Abraham comes to be through Jesus because Jesus is the resurrection and the life and the firstborn from the dead. Jesus is the first member of the new creation and everyone comes into the new creation through Jesus. This is the spiritual definition of sonship that Jesus is trying to explain. It's very similar to this Galatians thing. We get baptized into Christ and then we put on Christ. You join the new creation when you put on Christ. And even Abraham will only get to participate in the new creation in so much as he is born again through Jesus. So Jesus is before Abraham in this sense. Before Abraham comes to be, I am the Messiah now. That is Jesus's answer to the question, are you greater than Abraham? And the answer is yes, but it's for a strange reason. And the Jews misunderstand this reason. And that's why they try and stone him. He is not invoking the divine name there. That is not true. If you don't believe me, just about 10 verses later, Jesus has healed a blind person. This blind person is running around claiming to have been healed from his blindness. The Pharisees are like, who did this to you? And they're like, where's the man that was born blind? They're trying to find this man who was born blind. Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. The blind man kept saying, I am the man. This translation, I am the man, is the exact same Greek phrase. Ego ami, the exact same Greek letters. Like, look it up in your Greek interlinear or whatever, or Bible hub or whatever. I am he. It's the exact same Greek phrase. It's a way of identifying yourself. So I'm going to play a short video clip and then I will uh, um, talk about another passage. So this is James White in this debate uh, that he did with Dale Tuggy that I was at. So I'll play this clip. Uh, sorry, my internet's being a little bit slow. Hopefully that loads in not too long. I will say it was it was interesting being at this debate in person. Um, but here's the here's the the zinger. In John 18, 5 through 6, when Jesus is being arrested, the soldiers come and they, who are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth. And when Jesus says, Ego I me to them, what happens? They fall back upon the ground. We were told, well, well, you know, John, he, he, he's not really saying that Jesus is God in the highest sense. Think about it. Jesus says, I am, and the soldiers fall back upon the ground. That's the same phrase that Jesus used in John 8, 24, when he said, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Let me say something to you. A non-divine Jesus will never save you. A non-divine Jesus will never save us. Well, let's go back to this passage. So about these soldiers falling onto the ground, let's expand the context a little bit. So now Judas, who betrayed him, 
also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Jesus, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Who do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed them, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And so they again asked, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. So a couple things here. Is Jesus invoking the divine name, and is that why these soldiers fall back? It should be noted, the Jews were not allowed to have soldiers. So these soldiers that the, high, that the chief priests and the Pharisees have procured are Roman Gentile soldiers. So when Jesus is talking to them and answering questions, what language is he talking to them in? Well, I assume it has to be Greek. Maybe it's Aramaic, but probably Greek if these are Gentile soldiers, because like similar to how Japan wasn't allowed to have an army after America conquered it in World War II, the Jews had been too rebellious, so they weren't allowed to have their own soldiers. So these are Gentile soldiers who are stationed there so that the Jews don't rebel. So these Gentile soldiers are supposed to know that when Jesus says, I am he, which is a perfectly normal Greek phrase, that this somehow connects to what the God of Israel, whom they don't believe in, said in the book of Exodus, which they have likely never read, and we're supposed to believe that they know that he is reciting the divine name, and that's why these soldiers are scared. Um, and you'll notice, why isn't Judas the one who is scared? It's the guards that are scared, but not the Jew. So the idea that they're scared because this is invoking the divine name and they recognize that and they're like, oh my goodness, God is here. Like, so absurd. And you can clearly tell from the context what this phrase means. <laughs> they're looking for Jesus. And Jesus says, it's me. I'm him. I'm Jesus. They're scared because he's Jesus. <laughs> Not because he's God. Not because he's invoking the divine name. And then he does it a little lighter. He says, who do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he answered, I told you, I am he. I'm he's not saying I am God. He's saying I am Jesus. <laughs> and, and this is this climax that James White wants to use in his debate. It's just silly and absurd. Anyway. <sighs> okay, moving on. Jesus inherits God's name. So I would say that even more than Je Jesus just being sort of like a bearer of God's name, there's something unique that happens when Jesus ascends into heaven. It's sort of like that, that Galatians passage that talks about a son of the house when he's um, sort of in the maturation process. He's sort of underneath the um, masters and the teachers. But once he has grown up and matured, then he becomes the son in his house. So Jesus inherits his divine father's name, seemingly at a pretty specific point in time. And this is actually mentioned a couple of times. So this is Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus is receiving, he is being bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. What name is above every name? It's the divine name. That's the Tetragrammaton. Jesus is being given the Tetragrammaton. And all heaven and earth, all creatures, will bow down to Jesus and recognize his authority, but not in any way that usurps or replaces God. All of this is to the glory of God the Father who is still above him. Again, this is sort of paralleling my parable where I said that like God or the, the father retains the title chairman of the board, but the son becomes the CEO. It's something, I think, kind of similar to that. Something very similar happens in Hebrews. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe. I should really say, I think a better translation would be he rules or governs the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, 
He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So you can imagine when Jesus is on earth, he's sort of underneath the principalities and powers, even though he's the son of God, but he has not yet become the master of the house. And so once he ascends above the heavens and it sits at the right hand of God, he has become superior to the angels. He wasn't superior to the angels before. You can only become superior to the angels if you weren't superior before. And the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Well, what name has he inherited? Obviously, it's God's name because that is his inheritance. He receives his inheritance from God the Father. What's God the Father's real name? It's the divine name. So Jesus inherits that. And so that is the inheritance that is more excellent than the angels, because the angels never receive such an inheritance. All right. And uh, kind of hammering home this idea that Jesus gets exalted to a new position, this idea that he gets exalted as Lord and Christ. So let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So one thing, this is a whole complicated subject, but I'm going to try and cover it in just a few sentences. So the Jews at this time, out of respect, would often not say or even write the divine name. And the substitute in Greek at this time for the divine name was the Lord. In Greek, that's hokorios. And so instead of, in a lot of their translations of the Old Testament, instead of writing the divine name, the, in Greek, they would write hokorios, the Lord. And this actually, this practice carried over into English. In English, most of the time when you're reading a translation of the Old Testament, except for a very special few old translations of the Old Testament, instead of seeing the Tetragrammaton, you will see the Lord. Maybe it'll be in capital letters or something like that. And it's the Tetragrammaton in Hebrew, but in English, it's the Lord. They did a similar thing in Greek at the time where they would say, Hokorios, the Lord in Greek. And so I think that one of the reasons why Jesus is called the Lord is this is sort of him receiving the divine name, but in a certain amount of respect and circumlocution so as to not need to say the divine name, Jesus can be called the Lord, even though previously God the Father, or Tetragrammaton, in the Old Testament is the Lord. I believe that the right way to understand what happens is that Jesus gets called the Lord, because he has received the name that is above all names, the name that is superior to the angels. He has been made Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Similarly, Romans chapter 1, 1 through 4, so this is the very beginning of the book of Romans. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who is descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, Christ Jesus our Lord. So he is made, or not made, I should say, declared Son of God in power. So again, this idea of the Son, who previously was still a Son but didn't have power, and then gets made son in power, right? The son that has graduated above his teachers and is now a master in the house. He is the Son of God in power at the resurrection of the dead, Christ Jesus our Lord, right? This idea that the Lord is now a proper title for Jesus as sort of like a way of alluding to his inheritance of the divine name or almost even a substitution of the divine name in Greek. All right, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. Who is this one God, Paul, you might ask? Is the one God the Trinity or is the one God God the Father? For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Trinity. Oh, wait a minute, sorry, excuse me. For us there is one God, the Father from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. 
And again, I don't think that this is alluding to the original creation that like God was a con- the super contractor and Jesus was a subcontractor in the original creation. I think all things here, most of the time when you look at the way all things is used by the Apostle Paul, it means like the spiritual blessing and inheritance of the eternal age. And I think that that's what it's referring to. All things are from God. And especially like you can think about it in our prayer sense. When you pray and receive something, it's from God through Jesus Christ. All things that we get, all things that we receive, all of our spiritual inheritance, all things of the age to come are from God through Jesus. But you can see this distinguishing between the one God, who is the Father, and the one Lord. Well, you could say, Sam, wait a minute. If Jesus is the Lord, that has to mean that he's the Tetragrammaton from the Old Testament. And I think there is this bifurcation that happens because Jesus gets given the divine name, that there's this now bifurcation between the one God, the Father, and the one Lord, Jesus Christ. That's sort of similar to my analogy of um, the Father being the chairman of the board and the Son getting appointed to CEO when previously the Father was both chairman of the board and CEO or something like that. All right, Jesus is uh, inheriting God's name in the book of Revelation. So this is a really interesting passage. The book of Revelation, like I've been talking about names. The book of Revelation has more to do with the topic of names, receiving names, having names, secret names even. Like the topic of names in the book of Revelation is just a fascinating subject. So just like check that out sometime. But I can I, I can barely deal with it here. The one who conquers, I will make him, so this is Jesus talking to the church of Philadelphia. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. So what is Jesus's new name? At some level, we might not know it yet. There's another passage later on where Jesus says his name is written on a white stone and only he knows it. And in fact, all Christian saints get given a new name on a white stone. Shout out to my friend Luke, white stone Luke, white stone name Luke. And so in some sense, Jesus gets a new name. There's a name of this new Jerusalem and there's God's name. But you can tell Jesus's name and God's name are different. Jesus might be inheriting God's name, but God's name and Jesus's name are different. So that like this verse just like single-handedly disproves the idea that Jesus simply is the one named the Tetragrammaton. He might receive that, but he is not the, his God. And Jesus says, my God has a name that's different than Jesus's name. Similarly, Revelation 14, 1, then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So on our foreheads, we have the name of Jesus and the name of his father. So those are different names. And so we, in some sense, we, the saved Christians, will bear the name of Jesus and the name of God on our foreheads. All right, titles in Revelation. So I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. But here are some titles for God the Father in the book of Revelation. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler, the king of the earth. So God the Father is called him who was and is and is to come. I actually think that this is probably the closest thing to us ever seeing the Tetragrammaton transliterated into Greek in the New Testament. We actually never see the phrase ego ami ho on, which is the Greek translation of the divine name from uh, the burning bush. But the one who was and is and is to come, that's similar to the one who says, I am and I will be, right? I think this is basically as close a transliteration of the divine name as we get in the New Testament. And it is strictly speaking applied to God the Father, not Jesus. Um, Then the Lord God, and the Lord God is uh, the Tetragrammaton, God the Father. I am the Alpha and the Mega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So there are many titles which get applied to Jesus, including Alpha and Omega gets applied to Jesus. I'll go through the full list of titles on the next slide. But there are two titles that are reserved for God alone in the book of Revelation. One is who is and who was and who is to come. 
like I said, I think that might be something like a transliteration of the divine name. And Almighty, Jesus is never called Almighty in Revelation or anywhere else in the New Testament. Only God the Father is ever called Almighty in the New Testament. An interesting thing to think about. All right, Jesus receives a lot of titles, though, in the book of Revelation. Here's what I think is an exhaustive list. If I miss one, I'm sorry. Jesus is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of kings on earth, the son of man, the first and the last, the living one, him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who died and who came to life, him who has the sharp two-edged sword, the son of God, him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, the holy one, the true one, who is who has the key of David, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the shoot of Jesse, faithful and true, the word of God, king of kings and lord of lords, the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the shoot and the descendant of David, and the bright morning star. So I will say, like I said in my parable at the beginning of this, where the son uses titles that had previously only belonged to his father, like, um, I don't know, president of the marketing department, and exercises those titles. I think that's what's going on here. Jesus uses titles that were previously only true of God, like King of Kings, or Alpha and Omega, or the Amen, or the first and the last, and things like that. And Jesus here is not showing that he is God in a one-to-one -one sense, but he's showing that as the Son, who has ascended into heaven and has been seated at God's right hand, that he has received all sorts of titles and divine names and all sorts of acclamations, and that he can go around using these things as a demonstration of his heavenly power and authority, not that he is God, but that he has received these from God and he is authorized to use these titles from God and that he should be given the obedience and respect and submission that these titles are owed. All right, um, a couple things. Like in the book of Revelation, God is called he who is and who was and who is to come. Like I said, possibly an allusion to the divine name. Jesus is called the living one, and I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. So Jesus was, died, is alive, and is alive forevermore. The beast is called, the beast you saw was, and is not, and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. So again, there's these phrases about statuses of being, where God just always is in the past and now and in the future. Jesus, alive in the past, dead for a little bit, alive now, and will be forevermore. That's contrasted with the beast, who's an antichrist, who was, isn't, comes back, and then gets destroyed forever. So again, you can see the Jesus and the beast have parallel titles, but there's this contrast in that the beast gets destroyed, whereas Jesus lives forevermore. So again, this is and was and is to come, is, wasn't, and is, and will go to destruction. Again, the revelation is playing on these words. Jesus is also called the bright morning star. And there are many connections between the bright morning star and Satan throughout the Old Testament. So I will say that Jesus taking the title, the bright morning star, it's sort of like he's claiming a title that maybe used to belong to Satan and using it for himself. Again, not that Jesus is Satan, but he's saying that Satan is getting cast out. And now even these titles and responsibilities that used to belong to Satan now belong to Jesus. This is related to the theme in general, I think, that I kind of alluded to earlier, where Jesus is previously lower than the angels, but then gets exalted above the angels, and all humans will be exalted above the angels, at least the saved Christian humans. And that there's this change in the heavenly hierarchy where angels now get submitted to humans when previously we were submitted to angels, and that some of the angels aren't too happy about that and seem to try and prevent this from happening. All right, I'm going to play a somewhat long clip from my interview with a guy named David Capes. I'm coming relatively near to the end of this, so I'll play this clip, but I think it is really helpful. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, in the early, early in the book, I defined... Sorry, that's on double speed. 
I should put this on single speed so that if you're listening to me on double speed, you don't actually listen to this on quadruple speed. I should say David Capes, he's, I'm pretty sure he's like a Baptist evangelical Christian, but he's a widely respected um, Old Testament, New Testament scholar. And he has a book called The Divine Christ, which I think makes an argument that is surprisingly sympathetic to biblical Unitarianism. But I'm going to let him talk and explain that. Hopefully, my internet will load. Um, yeah. uh, what a Yahweh text is. And, and <laughs> maybe the best thing, so that I don't misspeak here, um, maybe the best thing is for me to, to talk a little bit about, about what, that, what that means and what that is. Um, a, a Yahweh text is a, a quotation of or an allusion to an Old Testament text that has the divine name in it. and so, so that's what it is, objectively. It is a quotation mm-hmm. that contains the divine name. Paul, in, in my estimation, Paul quotes Yahweh text about 14 times in his letters. Half of those, he refers to God the Father. The other half, he refers to, to Jesus in some mm-hmm. way as the kurios. Now, when I was coming through graduate school years ago, Sam, uh, I, what I heard was this. I heard that my professors say things like, well, Paul uses the word kurios in his letters 200 times, plus or minus a few. All of those refer to Jesus, except when he's quoting the Old Testament. So that was the only explanation that was given. And that seems wise to me. You know, they said Paul wouldn't do that. Well, I started looking at, well, maybe Paul did. Mm-hmm. Maybe there were occasions where Paul took a text containing the divine name and things associated with the divine name and then now made uh, uh, pivoted and made that a reference to to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in my estimation, there are about seven that do refer to God and seven that don't. They refer to the Lord Jesus. And every time that Paul sort of just alluded to, I mean, not quoting from, but just alluded to a text. Uh, all of those are Christocentric or Christologically focused. And so I use the, use the term Christological to refer to those that are referring to Christ and patrological to those who refer to the Father. Mm-hmm. Now, one of, the, one, of the, one of the best examples, I think, uh, other than the one I just y- used, which is really an illusion that is located in an early Christian hymn, likely, that was sung or chanted in, in, in churches, early Christian churches. It talked about Jesus being super exalted, given the name above every name, so that when his name uh, is called, every knee will bow, heaven on earth and under the earth, and say, declare that Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is, in a sense, identified with the God's ineffable divine name. And name is here, is not just... Uh, a cipher that you put on something name is person's cv is their reputation it's everything that they are right is their mm-hmm. rank is their dignity so name isn't just well my name is david and that's it right. it really uh referred more to the full history of that person right and so especially what, even more so if it's god's name absolutely yeah mm-hmm. and god's name was handled and you have the commandment you know you yeah. do not lift up the name of God in some empty, useless fashion. You know, you, you're very careful with the divine name. And early Christians, when they began copying their manuscripts, were very careful in copying their the names of, of the divine, mm-hmm. whether it's God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. They would they had special ways of writing down those names to indicate um, what. Um, you know, the kind of dignity or the reverence that they felt toward the son and toward the spirit as well. Uh, let me let me just give an example. Um, and, and there's a chart on my book on page 86 that sort of lays out. These are the, the ones that are that are God oriented where God's the referent to the text. And over here are the other ones where, where, where Christ is the referent. One of the ones that's the clearest and is undisputed is uh, in Romans 10. And let me let me just sort of lay out a little bit about Romans 10 in the time that we have. I know I'm probably talking too much. But anyway, Romans, Romans it begins in, in Romans uh, 10, 
then roughly verses 9 down to verse 13, somewhere in there. Now, one of the things that I would argue is that you cannot determine whether this is a God father oriented text or a christ oriented text until you really dig into the context and the things that are being said around it once you do that you can make a determination mm -hmm. now again some of those are a few of those are debated but by and large most agree with several that i i've made the case for and and others as well but here it says uh if you confess with your lips that jesus is kurios jesus is lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. The, a, verse that many, goes on to uh, a verse that many evangelicals will memorize. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, this mm -hmm. is this is this is this is like, you know, discipleship 101, right? You memorize right. this text. Well, the, the this sort of where all this is headed is verse 13. And in the meantime, he actually quotes a couple of other texts. He says, the scripture says, no one who believes in him. That is in Jesus, believing in Jesus, we put to shame. And there's no distinction in between Jew and Greek. He's the same Lord as Lord of all, etc. But it comes down to Romans 10, 13. And it's a quotation from Joel chapter 2, verse 32. And it says, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, that's an exact quotation from the Septuagint text. It it's a, it's a great rendering of even the Hebrew text. And so there's that phrase, the name of the Lord. Now, my argument is, and the argument of other people that accept, is that when Paul talks about the name of the Lord, he's not here referring to the Lord God. He's referring to the Lord Jesus. There's a lot of reasons to think that, the Christological sort of connections in and around, uh, beginning back in chapter 9, verse 33, all the way down even through this passage for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Now, when you look at that in the Old Testament, the word Lord is the divine name. <laughs> Call upon the name of Yahweh will be saved. And now that text is related closely to or identified with applied to Jesus. Right. So Paul is, Paul is saying, Paul is saying basically the fulfillment of that passage from Joel, which is everyone who calls upon the name of Yahweh will be saved. That, yes. that's fulfilled by everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus now. Absolutely. Yeah. You call mm -hmm. upon the name and it, it's not the name Jesus. It's the name that belongs to Jesus. Right. right? Yes. I, I yes. would, I was, I would say that that's really kind of a, what's called a, in, in grammatical terms, a genitive of possession at the name that belongs to Jesus. Every mm -hmm. knee will bow, every tongue will confess. In this case, the name of the Lord here, the Lord Jesus will be saved. Now, there's plenty of other things. Now, now, calling upon the name of the Lord is special sort of language. When you go back to the Old Testament, this is the language you would use when you're in the temple and you're making a sacrifice and you're calling upon God to do X, Y, or Z. You're getting ready to take a trip and you're wanting God to keep you safe on that trip. Or your wife is infertile and you're praying to God. You're doing a sacrifice and you're asking God to, uh, to do, you know, make your wife uh, a fertile so that you can have ch children, et cetera. Or whatever the ask may be, that's special language that's used, particularly in the temple, related to offering a sacrifice and then asking God to do something special for you. Now, in 1 Corinthians, if you look over in 1 Corinthians, just a few pages over, go toward the back, a few pages over, chapter 1, Beginning in, you know, verse one, um, Paul refers to himself, called by the will of God, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ and our brother Sosthenes. He wants to get thought Sosthenes name in there. And he's writing to the church of God, which is at Corinth. And this is what how it describes it. to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, set apart. In Christ Jesus. That language of sanctification is very important, right? They're called to be saints. That's another way of saying that saints, those who've been set apart, along with everyone who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's that phrase again. Now, it's not a quotation of, but for a person who knew the Old Testament well and they knew temple sacrifice well, and they knew what happened in the temple would be able to associate that very significant language 
So he's talking about all of us Christians are those when we gather, we may not have a temple, but we still are calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's very specific religious, uh, her taught it would say language of devotion, mm -hmm. uh, religious devotion, Christ devotion. So uh, like in, in these small house church settings, even in the first couple decades of Christianity, in their church service, maybe that's not quite the right word, but, but something like that, in, sure. the, in the liturgical yeah. context of their gatherings together as Christians, they're calling upon the name of yeah. the Lord, maybe right before, right at the beginning to kind of open up the ceremony, or maybe right at the end, uh, or somewhere around the, the communion meal or, or something like that. And so when Paul's saying everyone who yeah. calls upon the name of the Lord, perhaps everyone in the congregation or maybe everyone in that, that service is, is calling on Jesus's name in some sort of liturgical fashion together. And that's what he's referring to. I think, I think you're right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, Jews who met in the synagogue, they didn't, they didn't do sacrifices, but they did prayers. They did, they did a variety of things. Uh, they did songs. They did, mm -hmm. um, uh, but they didn't. They didn't sacrifice. You only sacrificed the temple. So, but that well, language, that that's a thorny. Order. There's a a thorny Protestant well, question that yeah. maybe you've gotten into with your Roman Catholic friend over whether or not the Eucharist is a sacrifice. Um, but uh, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. That that's true. That's true. That's true. But but in terms of what the sacrificial system had been um, up until that point, and what the reference to it, I, I think that's just part of it. So yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. So I think um, you're right. I think that language becomes very much uh, a, a kind of a centerpiece. Whenever we gather as Christians, we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And that's what distinguishes us from other Jews, from Gentile, or from pagans and, and everybody else. Exactly. Is, is us uniquely call upon Jesus's name to, um, I don't know, consecrate or set us apart in our in our religious service. Um, exactly. So, I guess I, I have a, a question, and this is really one of the, the questions that I was most eager to ask you, too, is I, I fully agree with you. I think that it, it's really pretty uncontroversial that, like you say, Paul appropriates Yahweh texts from the Old Testament and then applies them with the referent as Jesus in the New Testament. Sometimes they're patrological, but sometimes mm -hmm. I think it's incontroversial, or should be at least, I, I'm convinced by you that yeah. they they are yeah. applying to but, Jesus. And so I guess the question is, is that I can imagine two ways in which that could be done. And this sort of reverts back to the very beginning of our conversation where we talked about Paul's um, exegetical and hermeneutical techniques. Paul, Paul could be saying that, hey, that God back there in the Old Testament, that was Jesus the whole time. Or Paul could be saying there is a new Christological layer of the Old Testament that has been revealed to us that is kind of different than its original context, because I think you and, I, you and I both agree that Paul can perfectly well read Old Testament in its original context if that's what he wants to do. But then he can also sort of Christologically reapply the Old Testament if he feels that yep. that's appropriate. And so our, our, when Paul quotes Yahweh text about Jesus, is he saying it in that sort of original context, Jesus was that God all the way back there? Or is he doing it in a now in light of Jesus, we can see that there's a new meaning to this text that was in some sense there all along, but it is hidden and has now been revealed. Like in 2 Corinthians 3, Paul talks about how the Jews still read Moses with veiled eyes, but for us, the Old Testament has been unveiled in the glory of Jesus, right? So is it like an yeah. unveiled new meaning, or is it the, the original meaning all along? Like, basically, is Jesus that God in the Old Testament from time immemorial, or is Jesus now sharing in God's name and we can reapply it to him now? Yeah, I, I would, I would go more with the kind of the, what the second, the second idea uh, is, is. So I think that that is, sorry, that was a long clip. 
but I would recommend you watch that whole video, or I'd even high, more highly recommend you read this whole book by David Capes, Dr. David Capes. I thought it was really good. And um, if you're a biblical Unitarian, I would say, don't let the title turn you off. The Divine Christ, it sounds like it might not be very biblical Unitarian friendly, but I actually feel like his um, insights and conclusions and recommendations are surprisingly biblical Unitarian friendly. Basically, the idea, Old Testament, there is this latent meaning, this latent Christological layer that had been veiled, that no one had really quite been able to see. But now in the light of Christ, we can see some of the passages that were about the Lord or the Tetragrammaton in the Old Testament. We can now reapply them and see how they apply to Jesus, the Lord, the inheritor of the Tetragrammaton, in a new and interesting Christological way. All right. So I'm about to wrap this up. So is Jesus the Tetragrammaton? No. Also kind of yes. So no, in the sense that he is not the one who originally revealed his name as the Tetragrammaton at the burning bush to Moses. Jesus is not the one back there in the Old Testament. He is not God in that sense. But also, is Jesus the Tetragrammaton? Well, also, yes. God is acting through him. What Jesus does is something that God is doing. When you have seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. Jesus and the Father are one in a cooperative unity. So in the sense that he is God's only begotten son and is uniquely beloved and empowered agent, that through willful submission to the cross, it no, he is no longer under the tutelage of the Father or of the angels, you could say, but has matured into his inheritance and bears the Tetragrammaton, the divine name and many other titles of his God and Father now. In that sense, is Jesus the Tetragrammaton? Well, I would actually say yes. Maybe that's not what you're expecting me to say. So um, is Jesus Yahweh? This has been a topic of discussion. No, but also kind of yes. I hope that makes sense. Uh, I'm just going to go out with a benediction. This is a prayer that the Apostle Paul prays for the church at Ephesus. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. To that I say, amen, and thank you all for listening.